Hello, so I'm obviously Nicholas, and the reason this talk is called The Return of the Return of Peer-to-Peer Computing is because this is a reaction to Holger's classic uh, keynote at last year's EuroPython entitled The Return of Peer-to-Peer -peer Computing. Now, uh, the aim of this talk is, uh, well, like it says up there, to create a context in which you may think about peer-to-peer uh, -peer computing. Um, so it's very much a presentation of ideas, although it does contain some technical stuff uh, at a high hand-wavy level at the very end. Um, we've organized the talk this way because we believe that there's plenty of time for technology at a technology conference, and we'll deal with that at the very end. Um, but it's very important for us to clearly state our position and our ideas about peer to peer software. So that's basically what this talk is about. And uh, the modus operandi that I'm going to use for this is very simple. I'm going to provide a, I, what I hope is a clear movement of thought between uh, motivations uh, via questions and actions to outcomes. So we have some sort of tangible engineering aims at the very end of this talk that we can all agree we might be able to go and tackle. So part one, motivations. This time last year, uh, Edward Snowden's revelations were uh, published in The Guardian. Um, actually, this time last year, uh, I was working at The Guardian as a Python developer, and it was rather a fascinating place to be, uh, to be inside the organization that was actually breaking these incredible uh, news stories. But I don't really want to talk about Edward Snowden, really, uh, because he's been dealt with elsewhere. Um, what I want to talk about is the result, and the result uh, was a moral panic, um, apart from in the United Kingdom, uh, and I'm not sure why. Anyway, um, suddenly privacy became a bit of a hot topic. Um, but up until Snowden, um, privacy was a topic that was dealt with more uh, within the domain of, of corporations, a la Facebook, and obviously uh, Mr. Zuckerberg is very famous for stating that privacy is, of course, dead. Um, and for years, uh, I guess uh, the people in this room anyway have realized that, uh, that private corporations have been insinuating themselves into our lives um, by, uh, uh, by, by harvesting our data and so on and so forth. And, and this has been worrying me, at least anyway, since about 2009, um, and, and many others as well. So, um, so in response to uh, concerns about privacy from people like me, uh, you get a uh, corporate repackaging of the if you, have, if you have nothing to hide, you have nothing to fear type argument, which, uh, which is the quote from Eric Schmidt. Uh, if you have something that you don't want anyone to know, maybe you shouldn't be doing it in the first place. Interestingly, though, those who say privacy is dead are those who gain most from the surveillance of their users um, because their business, uh, their business plan is basically we're going to harvest your data and we are going to sell it on through targeted advertising and other things. So, of course, privacy needs to be dead. Anyway, rewind back to last year and Snowden suddenly makes privacy rather a hot topic for a wider audience than just developers in the room. And um, the governments uh, around the world went in, especially the British and the US governments, went into full-on uh, sort of panic mode. And uh, this, is, uh, this, is, this was the Foreign Secretary, um, which is, I guess, the equivalent of the Secretary of State in the US. This is uh, Mr. William Haig, who uh, represents all um, bureaucrats uh, in this example. And, and this is a typical example of what they're likely to say um, in response to the Snowden revelations. Now, I hope the audio works. If you are a law-abiding citizen of this country, going about your business and your personal life, you have nothing to fear. Uh, nothing to fear about the British state or intelligence agencies listening to your f the contents of your phone calls or anything like that. Indeed, you'll never be aware of all the things those agencies are doing. In fact, you will not be aware of all the things that those agencies are doing. <laughs> it's the way he ends it. Um, Happily, we are a bit more aware of, uh, of what these agencies are doing in our name um, as citizens of these countries. Uh, another formulation of, of Mr. Haig's argument is, only if you're doing something wrong should you worry, and then you don't deserve to keep it private. Um, and after all, uh, we don't want the bad guys to gain the upper hand. Um, and you guys, you're probably obviously upstanding, fine upstanding citizens and should be happy that innocents are protected from the evildoers that such a dragnet of surveillance will, will capture and identify. And um, 
This sort of argument, the uh, nothing to hide, nothing to fear argument, is often trotted out with, uh, with, with other classic defences, like think of the children, uh, terrorists, extremists, and uh, heaven forbid for us, um, hackers. So uh, this is a blatantly wrong argument. Um, for a start, it's a false dichotomy. Uh, what do I mean by that? I mean that it turns a very nuanced and complicated subject into a simplistic black and white subject. Okay, if you've got nothing to hide, you've got nothing to fear. That's it, black and white. Actually, uh, it's a lot more complicated than that, as I'm sure we all uh, know. Uh, it's also lazy thinking, too. Um, and it's manipulative as well, because you're framing the argument in, in a binary way, when in fact uh, it's a very nuanced, uh, nuanced argument. And putting that aside, uh, it's also an argument that hides several uncomfortable truths, which I'd like to explore now. So the first uncomfortable truth is that it's not you who determines if you have anything to hide or not. Um, for example, uh, these gentlemen who are uh, some prominent American Muslims who are law-abiding citizens. Um, they are political candidates, uh, civil rights activists, uh, academics, lawyers, people like that. Yet the NSA and the FBI have covertly been monitoring their emails and other communications. Uh, and this was done under a law uh, intended to target terrorists and foreign spies. Um, how do you think that makes uh, American Muslims uh, feel? As an aside, I read at the Guardian website this morning that the Metropolitan Police in London have been monitoring the communications of the family of the man they mistakenly shot on the tube train soon after the uh, July the 5th um, bombings. Uh, these, this was a grieving family, yet they were monitored. They had nothing to fear, yet they still had their communications monitored. You have nothing to fear because you've got nothing to hide. It assumes that surveillance results in correct data and sound judgment. Now, if you live in the UK, you'll be very familiar with this particular tweet. Uh, but some poor unfortunate gentleman who lives in Yorkshire was trying to catch an aeroplane one winter, and he tweeted, Crap! Robin Hood Airport is closed. You've got a week to get your shit together, otherwise I'm blowing the airport sky high. This was obviously a joke, you would think. Um, and then the police turned up, and he got carted away under terrorism. Uh, <laughs> I can't remember precisely what it was, but he got carted away. Anyway, um, it, he was imprisoned, and the, uh, the, um, the result was that they ended up going to the UK's highest court at much expense and getting thrown out. Um, so, you know, surveillance, you might... Uh, have a bit of a problem if the police get the wrong end of the stick, for example, or they're just collecting the wrong sort of data. If you're doing nothing wrong, you have nothing to hide. Well, rules and governments change. For example, in the UK, obviously I'm British, so many of these examples are British. In the UK, there's a law called RIPA, Reaper, and it's a UK law to monitor the communications of people for national security reasons, okay? You could understand why people might want such a law. And the way the law works is, is that it uh, allows certain, um, certain stated public bodies to be able to use such a law for such a reason. Um, and since the law was introduced at the beginning of the 2000s, uh, that list of public organizations who are allowed to use that, that law uh, has increased four times and now includes local councils. Um, so local councils have been found to be monitoring their citizens' communications uh, to track incidents of dog fouling. Um, if your dog craps in the street in the wrong place, you might be tracked. <laughs> if you have nothing to hide, you have nothing to fear. Um, well, you know, breaking the law isn't necessarily bad. Uh, if we look at this uh, rogues gallery of, uh, of people, I'll go, some of them might not be familiar, especially the second one in. So that's Socrates right at the very end, who was uh, executed for corrupting the youth of Athens with philosophy, no less. <laughs> Uh, the second one in is, is Emmeline Pankhurst, who was a suffragette, uh, who chained herself to Buckingham Palace uh, in the cause of women's rights and getting votes for women. Uh, obviously, I'm guessing you all know Mohandas Gandhi, who was imprisoned uh, for, um, for basically trying to uh, ind make 
India independent from the, from the British uh, uh, Empire, and obviously Nelson Mandela, a recent example, imprisoned for his uh, protest against apartheid. Um, now, these are widely regarded as people who acted as beacons of hope. Um, and I guess, you know, hindsight is a good thing. Um, but uh, what I'd like to ask is, how would their causes have survived in a digital panopticon if the, if the authorities that imprisoned and, in some cases, executed these people uh, were able to um, view their communications? And finally, if you've got nothing to hide, you've got nothing to fear, we should be able to watch you. Uh, well, actually, you know what? Privacy is a fundamental human right. Um, there are many examples that, that enshrine this right, but the one I've chosen is sort of the, the, uh, the big daddy, as it were. And, and this is from the United Nations Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Um, and I'm believing, and I, I guess that you do too, that things like intimate declarations of love and doctors discussing their patients and engineers uh, working on a new top secret project or, or journalists planning an expose of the government, um, these, these are just a few scenarios where privacy is both a reasonable and legitimate uh, requirement. Yeah, of course, uh, people want to surveil you. So am I saying that privacy trumps all? Absolutely not. Openness of public institutions, governments, and corporations, I believe, is a fundamental requirement for our society uh, to be able to function. Otherwise, how else are we going to be able to hold such entities to account if we don't know what they're up to? I also believe that surveillance is legitimate given probable probable cause for concern. And I'm not the only person who believes that. Uh, can anyone identify where this comes from? It's the Fourth Amendment to the Constitution of the United States of America. Uh, the right of the people to secure or to be secure in their persons, house, houses, papers, and effects against unreasonable searches and seizures shall not be violated, and no warrants shall issue but upon probable cause, supported by oath or affirmation, and particularly describing the place to be searched and the persons or things to be seized. Um, I guess I'm not the only one in the room who sees the great irony of, of the Fourth Amendment. So you're sitting there thinking, hang on, we're at EuroPython here. Uh, this is a technical conference, and uh, this, who is this um, British guy ranting on for the last 10 minutes about politics? After all, what has politics got to do with programming? We're engineers. So a straw man engineer might ask questions like, well, we're engineers, uh, we like to solve engineering problems, and I don't really worry about the politics of stuff and things like that. I'm far more interested in the hard problems of technical technology and servers and code and things like that. Um, for example, we ask questions like, you know, what is the best way to organize computational resources? And we answer them um, with things uh, by, by thinking about architecture and design. Uh, we also uh, think about how should such arrangements uh, be created? You know, what tools are we going to use? We use Python, we use databases. We use methodologies like test-driven development and agile methodology. We organize ourselves. And also we ask, who is responsible for making such things work? In a team, we have people who have particular responsibilities. There's the QA guy, there's the, there's the DBA, there's the, there's, the, there's the developer, there's the business analyst, there's all these different roles, and each is responsible for doing something. Uh, and each of them also has authority to do certain things. Perhaps only the QA person is allowed to deploy the thing to the server, the, the, the website to the server, because they're the one who signs off that the QA is, 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 is done. Um, we also have... Uh, people who um, create standards uh, that, we, that we use um, so that we, uh, in some ways, delegate, delegate, delegate responsibility uh, for making things work by following standards that are, are made in public. Um, so if you contrast these with problems in political philosophy, after all, what has engineering got to do with, with politics? Um, so political philosophers, and I'm not saying politicians here, I'm talking about political philosophers, people who think about politics, not the politicians who are the ones involved in the political system itself. Um, these guys ask questions like, what is the best way to organize humanity? I mean, that's a pretty big question to ask. What's the best way? What forms of governments should we, be, uh, should we um, try and uh, promote? Um, they, they think about the problems of democracy. Uh, they think about things like corporate structures within the public sphere, things like that. 
Um, how should such arrangements be created? Uh, they, they try and define concepts such as duty and rights, and they think very carefully about how the law should, uh, should come, up, come to pass and how it should be enforced. Talking of enforcement, who is responsible for making such things work? Who has the power in a society? Who has authority? How does governance work? This is, this is political philosophy 101. So I would say, I'm asserting, that uh, programming is politics, quite simply because we are asking and answering questions about organization, process, power, and control. Um, we're writing, implementing, in some respect, we control the laws of the digital world. Uh, if you look at it that way. Um, so, part two, questions. Assuming that these things are important, that politics and programming are important, uh, how do we explore this program? Uh, what questions as developers uh, should we be asking ourselves? And so we turn to Holger, who I notice is sat at the back of the room. Um, so last year, Holger uh, focused on these, uh, these political aspects of programming by asking several um, pertinent questions. What digital world do I want to live in? What sort of software do I want to create as a developer? And if you're a parent, what legacy do I leave for my children? Um, how would you answer these questions? And remember my aim at the beginning, which is to give you a context in which you can think, and part of having that context is being able to answer such questions. So, uh, one of the um, conclusions that, that Holger and, and, and I and many others believe uh, is important is, is the answer to this question. Is peer-to-peer -peer and ubiquitous cryptography a way to address the concerns over power and control in a digital world? So I'm going to, because I don't have that much time, I'm going to brush over cryptography, assuming that you can go and read a book about it somewhere. And this is talk about peer-to-peer. -peer. So let's examine what peer-to-peer -peer means and how this affects the political aspects of the talk that I was just talking about. So what, what do I mean by peer-to-peer? -peer? Um, well, this is my back of a fag packet definition. Peers of equal status, or devices running appropriate software, cooperate in a loose, decentralized network for mutual benefit. Um, and also peer-to-peer -peer is the antithesis of hierarchy, where some have elevated status and power over others. And uh, one way to, to visualize this is with the taxonomy diagrams, the very simple taxonomy diagrams uh, over there. Um, on the left is peer-to-peer, -peer, uh, and on the right is the client-server topology that we use on the web. Um, notice that the red spot is the point of power and control in the web. Um, and wherever there's power and control, well, that's where politics is. Um, so let's just think very carefully about how this affects for example, the World Wide Web, which is probably the most ubiquitous technology platform of the day. So the client-server architecture of the web is fundamentally unbalanced um, because the server always has power over the client. Okay? You authorize yourself, authenticate yourself against Facebook servers, for example, and then Facebook decides whether you are allowed to see this content or that content or the other content. Um, and, of course, the server can decide that it's just not right for you to see certain content at all because it's illegal. Uh, also, uh, a server is a single point of failure uh, that is obviously, uh, that it is also an obvious target for attacks. Uh, we all know about the Twitter fail well, uh, but where did the NSA go when they wanted to try and uh, hoover up lots of people's emails? Uh, they tapped into Google because, you know, lots and lots of people use, Google, use Gmail. Um, so am I saying that hierarchy is bad? Uh, no, I'm not. Sometimes hierarchy is very good, um, especially when it's efficient and it saves lives. If I was having brain surgery, I would like to know that the person in charge of that team had trained for several years and was acknowledged as an expert in their field. I wouldn't want to have surgery from a democratic group of, I don't know, hippie doctors who would vote at every point in the operation as to what to do next. I'm more likely to be dead. Uh, as a result of that. So it's important in certain situations that there is definite power and control. Um, but the important thing to note is that in an ideal world, such a hierarchy is best when the obvious skill, knowledge, and capabilities of the person or the entity are acknowledged to bring about greater benefit for all. Um, in an ideal world, those with elevated status and authority would have earned it via reliable and consistent public 
displays of such skill, knowledge, and capabilities. Okay? So everyone knows this is a good surgeon because not a lot of people die when they're on the slab with him. Okay? For example, him or her. It's a him in this photo. In an ideal world, the responsibility and trust associated with such status and authority would be a serious yet welcome obligation. Um, but we don't live in an ideal world. Uh, we, live in a, we live in a digital world where architecture, in some sense, defines power and control, as I just tried to illustrate with the client-server model of the web. Um, if Facebook changed their terms and conditions, we have no way to challenge them, not only because they're the ones in control of the servers, but also because they, in some sense, uh, they've trapped us in their walled garden of data. Um, all our photos, all our lives, all our, all our social life is within this walled garden controlled by Facebook. For example, so I'm about halfway through the talk, um, and I want to summarize. So programming, I believe, is politics, because we're thinking about process and power and control of digital assets. Um, we agree, I hope, that strong cryptography protects against surveillance. And we agree, I hope, that surveillance is, in some forms, um, not a good thing to have. Peer-to-peer, um, -peer decentralized, distributed, federated systems mitigate points of control. And authority derived from architecture is bad. However, authority derived from evidence is good. So what can we do to address these issues? So part three, actions. <laughs> so this time last year, uh, I didn't know Holger. Uh, and I was moving house. Uh, and as Holger was giving his keynote, um, I get kept getting tweeted by, uh, by friends in the audience saying, you should contact Holger, he's doing this peer-to-peer -peer stuff. Nicholas, you're interested in peer-to-peer -peer stuff, you should get together, which is what I did. And Holger got together with lots of other people at EuroPython, and the outcome of that is that we decided that we would get together, a group of us, and organize some sprints where we would be able to explore the ideas surrounding peer-to-peer -peer and cryptography and so on and so forth, uh, and we'd try and do something as well. Uh, obviously, Jonas needs an avatar because he doesn't really look like an egg. So, at this sprint, what were our aims? Uh, at this sprint, uh, we grew a community interested in re-decentralization of the internet. We also have people from redecentralized.org in the audience, which is a fantastic project. Um, Ira, put your hand up. Talk to her. Promoting non-surveilled communication is another thing we're interested in. Uh, exploring existing solutions, because we're not the first people to be worried about this sort of thing, and doing something practical as well. We're programmers. We can do stuff with digital assets. So, at this sprint, at the first sprint, we asked ourselves two important questions. Uh, what are the fundamental elements of a secure peer-to-peer -peer system and what can we build uh, that is useful um, to this end? So at the sprints we looked at uh, existing technologies, Bitcoin, peer-to-peer -peer messaging, etc, etc, etc. And at the sprint we also plugged Holger into the matrix as well. Uh, and the point I'm trying to make here is that, seriously, you don't need to do silly things uh, to enjoy yourself at these sorts of sprints because these are fun and interesting and challenging engineering problems. And you don't need to be plugged into anything to, uh, to enjoy them. Um, we also decided we would try and organize ourselves at conferences like and gatherings like this one. I'll come on to that in a minute. Um, but most importantly, I guess, is that we wanted to prototype at conferences and gatherings like this one. So we had something tangible, some code that we could point people at. So at least people could say, that's wrong, you're doing it wrong, or that's good, I might join you. This stuff isn't going to happen by itself. So talking about outcomes, uh, what were the outcomes? So like I said, prototypes and hacks. And uh, there are two that I would like to talk about. Um, uh, we, uh, we explored the problem of, uh, of a peer-to-peer -peer cryptographic message passing uh, system, completely decentralized, and uh, we also looked at a universal distributed hash table as a platform, um, which was based on some work that I've been doing on a project called the Drogulus. I'll, I'll give you a very high-level view of both of these, uh, these, these projects now. So, the peer-to-peer -peer decentralized crypto messaging. Um, Holger calls this the test card. Because if we can make this work, we've solved many of the fundamental problems of, of a cryptographically secure peer-to-peer -peer system. Um, we also had expertise within the group. Uh, we had uh, Jorgis, who is one of the developers of the Cryfo project, which is an uh, in-browser uh, cryptographically safe uh, chat system. And he was there. It's very good to have him and his expertise there. Um, and we also looked at existing solutions, uh, and we found many. Uh, but the most interesting was one called RetroShare, 
uh, that met many of our um, requirements for such a system, but not all of our needs. So uh, we tried to work out what are the gaps that we can fill in. And so to give you a sense of some of the, th some of the thoughts that we've been having at these sprints, um, I just want to uh, pause a moment and, and, and describe one of the problems that, that we have. Um, the problem is, in a secure decentralized message delivery system, um, how do you communicate with offline peers? Now, with email, it's very simple. I just send my email to your email server, and the next time you come online, you go and collect it. It's almost like a sort of a post box for you. Um, but that's a centralized point of control. It's somewhere, as we know, with Gmail and so on and so forth, that people can intercept your communications. So we wanted to make this completely decentralized, if we could, with no single point of failure, so that the message could, could get through in a secure way. Um, so. Um, what we've been looking at is, uh, is building a system that allows uh, trusted online, online friends to, to sort of pass the message uh, like a baton in a real re relay race until the message is delivered. Um, and what we're trying to work out is can this be done in a completely decentralized way? And it's early days and we'll, we'll have to see how, how it goes. Um, the other important thing that, uh, that we realized is that signaling and discovery are the key. How do you know when this person is online or offline? Um, and this leads me to the, sort of the second project uh, that I talked about. Uh, you could use a distributed hash table uh, to do that. So um, let's have a look. Uh, what is a distributed hash table? Um, everybody knows what a dictionary is in Python. Yes? Yeah. OK. It's a distributed one of them. <laughs> It is literally a distributed and decentralized key value store. There's no single point of failure or control. Uh, it scales to a huge number of nodes as well. Um, lookup is relatively efficient, although obviously it's done over the network. Um, and it also, uh, depending on which algorithm you use, uh, the one I'm using is one called Kademlia. Um, it has good handling of, of fluid network membership because, of course, there are nodes joining and leaving the network all the time. Okay, um, And it's also tested in the real world, distributed hash tables, because BitTorrent and Freenet and other similar uh, projects use distributed hash table for lookup. But they use a distributed hash table for just their application. And what we were thinking about doing is a universal distributed hash table. So any application could, um, could store key value pairs in, in this DHT. So the universal DHT, uh, it's my current obsession, programming project obsession. Uh, I, I work on it on the train when I go into London and uh, those late nights when my kids have finally gone to bed and so on and so forth. So development is a little bit slow. Um, but it solves the problem of, of discoverability and signaling because people can leave uh, their status uh, within the key value pair, within the, within the dictionary. Friends can look up. Um, we also had a quick look at uh, sorry, we didn't look. We had to think about how we could make this work. I'm not going to talk about this very much because it's, I'm not even sure we understand it. Um, but uh, we were discussing a platform called P4P2P, which is distributed hash tables within distributed hash tables. So these are namespaced in some ways, so, so that particular, um, particular applications can use particular parts of the network um, that, most, that, that, that best meet their needs. So you're probably sitting there thinking, well, he's had about half an hour now. Um, this sounds far too utopian, um, you know, hippie. And it'd be quite valid for you to, to ask why. You're, you're obviously crazy, you guys. Um, and that's usually quickly followed up by, uh, you know, what about the economics of this sort of stuff? Um, you know, how is, how is development um, funded for peer-to-peer for -peer systems? You know, how, how do you put uh, uh, food on the table? Um, so, well... Let's think. Serendipity. Oh, there's a good example of that. that happened last year at EuroPython. You know, I kept getting tweets about Holger from friends who just happened to be in the room. Um, I met people that I'd never met before at these sprints, but they're here and they're my friends now. So serendipity, serendipitously, God, um, we met and we're collaborating together. Why is that? Well, perhaps it's because we share the same values. We, we actually care very passionately about our privacy and, and working in a world where um, where a peer-to-peer -peer system is 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 some way of enabling us to uh, to build a digital world that we want to live in. Um, it's also fun. Um, that's a good reason why you might want to work on this sort of thing. These are fun engineering problems, as I as I demonstrate, as I hope I've sort of demonstrated. And it's also that itch for for me. Um, everybody has a different sort of an itch, but that's my particular itch. It might be yours. And it's also important to remember that um, there was no economic argument made when the web was born. 
uh, as Tim Berners-Lee said, the web is more of a social creation than a technical one. Uh, and uh, he designed it for social effect, uh, to help people to work together. And therein is the value of the web. Um, he didn't sit down going, hmm, what world-dominating uh, hypertext system could I invent? It sort of grew from the bottom up, which um, chimes in with, uh, with the keynote from yesterday morning. Um, it's also important to remember that even as far back as 1996, uh, William Gibson, uh, the science fiction author, I'm sure you're all familiar with him, um, said uh, in an article that the World Wide Web is the test pattern for whatever will become the dominant global medium. Uh, the reason I'm saying this is because it's very easy for us uh, at this time, after 20 years of the existence of the World Wide Web, to have World Wide Web goggles on. So everyone uh, seems to see things. Uh, we must have a website for that. We must use a RESTful API. We must use HTTP, because that's what everybody uses. Um, well, perhaps it's time that we might be able to think about, think outside the box and think, well, what should come after the web? What post-web solutions and digital architectures should we, should we be using? Um, which leads me um, on to uh, Alan Kay. Uh, Alan Kay is very famous for saying the best way to predict the future is to invent it. Um, and we're in a very uh, privileged position as developers because we could actually build that future with Python. Um, but I actually like this quote more. Uh, I believe that the only kind of science computing can be is like the science of bridge building. Somebody has to build the bridges and other people have to tear them down and make better theories. And you have to keep on building bridges. What's the next bridge after the World Wide Web? Um, the penultimate slide, so I've nearly finished, don't worry. <laughs> this uh, is some cuneiform uh, that's in the British Museum. It's 5,100 years old. It's one of my favorite places to be, the British Museum, because you can't help but get um, an enhanced sense of perspective. You know, in internet years, you know, two years is a huge amount of time. Uh, this is 5,100 years old. It's, some of the, it's one of the earliest examples of writing that we have, and it records the allocation of beer, you'll be pleased to know, uh, by administrators in the city of Uruk. Uh, and the symbol representing beer is, is actually an upright jar. I'm not sure if I can find one yet. Okay. Like that one. Um, with a pointed base. And it... it, it and the amounts of beer that these workmen have been, or work ladies have been having, is, is denoted by the circles and the crescents. Okay, that's their counting system. And if you look in the bottom left, there's actually a person uh, drink, drinking from the bowl, and that's kind of like the receipt to say that the goods have been received. There's a bowl. He's got a bit of a, bit of a smile on his face. <laughs> so. I would like to uh, end by asking you, uh, is the World Wide Web our cuneiform clay tablet? And uh, what should we be building afterwards? Um, if you would like to discuss this more with not just me, but my friends that went on the sprints as well, because what I presented here is very much a group effort. Uh, meet us in the foyer at uh, 5.30 this afternoon, and we'll have a chat, and we'll probably go out afterwards for, for beer and food. The end. Is there time for questions? The key signing is right at the time. I can't hear you. The key signing. The GPG key signing is almost in parallel to that time in, in the basement. So it's a bit unfortunate somehow. OK, I didn't realize that. <laughs> it actually, we looked into key signing um, when we were at our first sprint. Now, you've got to remember there were about nine highly technical people in the room, and we managed to do it wrong, um, which says a lot for, for key signing. There are lots of ways that you can improve uh, security, um, but uh, we, we got it totally wrong. No more questions? OK. Oh. How did I guess? <laughs> David, who's going to ask the question, is my colleague. <laughs> so what is the best way to organize humans? To organize? Humans. That was your, your big question. OK, so um, I should say that David has a philosophy degree. Um, <laughs> as do I. And 
my answer would be, um, if you come along at 5.30 this afternoon, <laughs> we can work out the details then. And actually, we could put a note in our, in our, in, in our sprint plan, um, and we can create a ticket to discover what the, uh, the best way to organize humanity is. Uh, you said there is a small community of people working on that stuff, but the only thing I find on your website is contact is your Twitter uh, account. So what medium do you use to communicate except meeting in meet space for some sprint? There should be some more effective way without driving through Germany or whatever. Yeah, you're, you're probably quite right. Um, I'd say in our defense, this is early days, and we're a group of people who are just exploring the ideas, um, and it's not as if we've announced a political party or a new free software project or something like that yet. Um, we're getting together to, to think about these ideas. We communicate on IRC in a channel that has nothing to do with peer-to-peer, uh, -peer. Um, <laughs> because it's run by one of the, uh, one of the guys, uh, it's his company IRC channel on Freenode. Um, so I'm not sure he might not like me uh, sharing that channel. Um, but it's informed. Okay, so the first thing you can do is come along at 5.30 and we can talk and share email addresses and things like that. You can't. Okay, the second thing you can do is you can prod me on Twitter and I will get back to you. Uh, the third thing you could do is probably annoy Holger and send him emails because he's quite a high profile person as well that, uh, th that will be able to disseminate information because he, people follow him an awful lot. Um, but you are quite right. This is something that we need. We've been enjoying ourselves with distributed hash tables rather than uh, IRC channels and Twitter accounts, I'm afraid. Irina, do you want to have the microphone over there in the middle? Uh, it, needs to be, it needs to be recorded for the for posterity, so you better say hello to posterity. Just, uh, hi, everybody. Um, I just to say, because obviously it sounds like you guys have a bit of a clique out there, you know, hanging out. For those who want to join a broader, broader movement, there is a, a, a re-decentralized mailing list, um, uh, re-decentralized re at liberalist.com, um, uh, with public archives where there's a huge community of people who are interested in re-decentralization technology, in adoption, in, you know, how do we change stuff. So, like, that is a really good discussion list, and there's, like, a whole website as well, which you can join and follow and get involved with other people and have discussions. So I would encourage Definitely. people to do that. Definitely. Join Arena's list. Um, I'm a member of it. If you if you go if you search Google for uh, redecentralized.org, um, well don't 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 go to Google. Type it into your URL uh, thing at the top of the uh, redecentralized.org, and through the magic of the internet, this web page will appear, uh, and they have interviews with various people uh, who are doing uh, very similar projects uh, in the peer-to-peer -peer sphere. I think because we need to sort of turn the room around for the next talk. Now's a good time time to finish. One more question then. Okay. Uh, here. Hello, hello, hello. <laughs> uh, so, the five questions that you had there on the blackboard. Yeah. I think the most interesting is the fifth one. And uh, some political philosopher in Poland recently said that it's not about uh, who we give the power to, it's about how we can remove them when, when they fail our when they yeah. fail to deliver what, what they were supposed to do. Yeah. And uh, it seems that this distributed peer-to-peer -peer communication is about taking away the power from everyone uh, so that nobody holds the power. Uh, the, so the power is not centralized. But uh, yes. there are many instances of stuff where, for example, when, when you make a standard, you need to have a centralized power to make this standard happen, right? You need a, some some kind of standardizing committee. For, for example, like English, for example. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, do you have any ideas of how to organize the, the removal of people you don't trust anymore? Yeah, yeah. I mean, it, just for your interest anyway, this blackboard, uh, that's half the blackboard. The bottom half um, is even better. Um, but it was only the top half that was pertinent for this part of the talk. Uh, this was created by a, um, a UK politician called Tony Benn, who recently died. Uh, but if you look up Tony Benn's five rules, uh, you'll see the whole picture. Uh, he's very, very good. That's it, I guess. Thanks a lot, Nicholas, for your great talk.